Hello, good day, and welcome back. So we're still talking about Go concurrency patterns, and so today we're going to be looking at the daisy chain pattern, or what I'm going to also call pipeline, and also assembly line. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, if you don't know what daisy chain it is, it's just sort of linking things together, right? Um, and so without further ado, let's let's look into it. Um, so basically, my words again is just a matter of linking Go routine that consume and produce. And so that's where the idea of daisy chaining or pipelining comes in together comes in. Um, I also try to think of it as an assembly line. Um, if you think about in manufacturing, where you might have assembly line going down, and then someone is gonna take something off assembly line, do some work on it, and put it back, and then it's not completed, and then somebody else is gonna be responsible for taking that piece off from the previous person uh, who put it on there, do something else, and then put it back on the assembly line, and it moves down the line. And as it moves down the line, that things become a that thing becomes a finished product. Okay, does that make sense? And so I tend to think of it in that way. And so here's an example. So there's a go for a routine, and it's gonna somehow be given something, or maybe it starts it, and it's you know produces something that it puts on the uh, channel, and then that becomes the input for another go for routine B, who takes that manipulated in some way. And then puts it out on another channel, and you know, blah blah blah, and so on and on it goes until everybody's got a piece of it, and you know, do whatever they need to do until at the end, um, the last guy gets it, and you know, p prints it out or do the final touches on it, and of course that's where it ends, right? So this one the starts, and this represents the end here. So a is the start, and f is the end, and the way we're doing this example, we're not going to really write a go routine to represent the end. Or go routine to represent the start. We can just kind of write a go routine to represent these guys that gets an input and produces some output and link those together. And then we're gonna kick things off by just creating a value that we stick in here to get going, and then take the last value out of here. Okay. And um, if you look at that video I mentioned, which is by Robert Pike, Go Concurrency Pattern, and you should definitely look it up if you haven't watched it yet. Check it out in YouTube. Um, in both his example, which is what I'm pretty much using, my example, we just kind of push one value through this pipeline. But if you could push one value through, you understand how to push multiple. Instead of having your worker function sort of end after reading one value, you know to sit in a loop in a go routine and just keep reading values, okay? So um, definitely just reuse the things you've learned and I don't have to keep mentioning it, uh, keep mentioning it, okay? So let's go to the example. So we're going to start here as usual, and and you know this goes um, five, um, five. You raise it, make that six, and cd into six, and then start up our code editor. And so this is where we left off the last time, and so I'm not going to use any of this code. Um, again, I'm going to start sort of do things two ways today. I'm going to show you how you're going to see it in that video if you sort of look at it. And then I'm going to show you how another way, how I would prefer to do it. But there's no right way or no wrong way. Remember, in computer programming, there are several ways to do things, right? Any one thing. So I'm just going to show you two. So let's imagine you have a function um, f or worker, for example. And what it's going to do, it's going to take input. So Robert uses left and right, but I'm going to say, uh, we just have input and output, and so worker has input, output, and those are channels on which it can receive um, stuff, right? And so it's going to receive something on one input channel and write it on the output channel. And this function, this worker, is really, really simple. It just reads the value from the input, and then on the output, it simply tries to send one plus the value that it got from the input. So our gophers here are simply receiving a value, add one to it, and sending on one plus whatever they got, right? And so you can imagine if you put one, if this guy started off and spit out one, this guy's gonna add one to it, and so that's gonna two, and he's gonna spit out two. This guy's gonna add read two, add one to it, and spit out three. He's gonna read three, spit, add one to it, spit out four. Is gonna read four, add one to its pair of five, and of course at the end of this, um, we should have five. And that tells us that five gopher touched it essentially, 
Uh, this last guy, he's just printing out the results, so he didn't get in the whole business of doing any operation, right? Um, so let's see. Um, and so just as, as simple as it is, right? Again, remember, if you want to keep this, make this a go for routine that just keep reading from the input and writing to the output, you just have to sit in a for loop or, or something, right? All right. Um, so what do we need to do now? Well, let's imagine that I had a channel I'm going to call um, C and make a channel, make channel of int. And that is like my input channel, right? Uh, C is my input channel. And so I have output, which I'm going to get from the fact that I call. Um, so what I want to do is um, get an output channel also and say, make the output channel int. And what I'm going to do, because here for my worker, they expect input and output. So I better make those, OK? Um, uh, I better make those. And so I'm going to say worker, you know, go do some work. Um, worker, please go do some work using this input and this output channel that I have. All right. Now, at this point, when I get to this point here and I launch this go routine, this go routine is going to come block waiting to read from my input because I haven't put anything on the input yet. All right. And of course, um, it can't even write to the output yet because I know I trying to read. And so what I can do is say on the input channel, I want to send this value um, like one, for example. And I know I've sent a value, that go routine that I launch is going to be able to read that one, write, add one to it, write two, and then it's going to terminate, right? But I'm still in main here. I can do fmt that print line, print a line. And it's going to read um, from out and spit it out. Okay. Um, actually, um, all right. So that's fine. Now, let's go run this and make sure we see two. Okay. Because we're going to insert one to kick it off, and we have one go routine. So it's going to add one to it, and um, we're going to get two. All right. So we will go run main. And I get two. Now, if I inserted zero, and I have one go routine that's just going to add one to it, it receives zero, I add one, and so I should expect one because I inserted zero. All right. Now, if I want to do this in a loop, so just imagine that I want to sit in a loop, and what I want to do is basically I want to say before I get zero, I is less than some number n, I plus plus. I don't want to sit here in a loop and just make go routine and launch them, okay? And so uh, let's think about what we're doing here. We're going to make a channel. We assign it to out, right? And let's keep this here for now. I'll make a channel called out because I already have an input to kick things off. But this, so in, for the first go routine I'm going to make, the input to that go routine is going to be in that I already make outside of this loop. Output is going to be what I make inside the loop. And then if I'm going to sit in a loop, in is going to be equals to out. So I want to reassign that. And then I loop around, make another output channel. And the previous out that I had when I make a new go routine, it in becomes the previous out that I had. And then I make a new out and I keep looping around. How many times I want to do this? Well, in Robert's um, thing he did cons equals like, you know, I think 10,000 or 100,000. I'm going to do 100,000. And this is also going to try and show you that our go routine are really, really lightweight. And we're going to get more the idea of lightweight and heavyweight um, things towards the end of this chapter. But just imagine that if I really try to create 100 CPU threads or processor tr um, processes or something, I couldn't really do it on my machine. 100,000? No, not going to happen. Not even 100 proud. No, maybe I keep it with 100. But anyway, not 100,000 for sure. Or not even 10,000. So not all, not them being, uh, to be able to be managed concurrently. Not necessarily in parallel. They all have to run in parallel. But just being the overhead of trying to manage that I have 10,000 treads or 100,000, right? On my, little, my Mac here. Okay, or your computer, whatever you're using. Or desktop or whatever. 
and so I'm gonna sit there and loop around. Now, once I finish doing the last, the very last, um, the very last go routine, its output is actually stored in this variable in, right? Because I would have come, created the output, created that go routine, and said, hey, I want you to produce stuff on this output. I would assign out to in, and then I'd go back and see, oh, I don't really need to create any more go routine. So the output for the last go routine is actually in my in variable here. And that's why I kind of created um, C, because I know how in was going to be overwritten. So I don't really want to kick things off by writing zero to in, because that is really the output of the last one. I really want to kick things out by writing to C, and then my output that I want to read for the last go routine is really this in variable, right? Now I can make this less confusing by simply creating a variable called out over here, var out is channel of int, and then instead of recreating um, out here, and then here, this is still going to apply because um, since out was last assigned the last channel that I made, even if I assign it in here, it wasn't overwritten. So by the time I get out of the for loop, out is still out, which is the last one. And, you know, we're still going to kick stuff off by pushing it into C because we have overwritten um, in so many times in here, okay? So, and then, like you said, at the end of this for loop, in and out really do have the same value, so I couldn't use that in, but I have to use the very first channel that I used to create the very first go routine. So now I've pushed zero into that very, send that to the very first go routine. It added one to it, and then, um, sorry, it blocks, waited, more go routine. So at the end of this for loop, when we're here, before, uh, before I even send the value zero in, I've already created a hundred thousand go routine that are just all blocked waiting, right? I have a hundred thousand plus one channels, right? Um, because I created a hundred thousand in this loop and I created one outside the loop. So a hundred thousand one channels that were created plus a hundred thousand go routine that are blocked and waiting to run. And once I send this first value, the first one is going to add one to it and it's going to exit. And so you can imagine I go from, you know, a hundred thousand go routine waiting so, da, 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 and then they start just run and exit, run and exit until I don't have any more. And the very last one runs, write its value that it received from the previous ones to the out channel, and that is the out value that I'm going to read. So, if I put in zero, I should expect the output should be 100,000. And so, let's go here and run. So, run main, and there we go. Right? So, that tells you that our all 100,000 go routine were created and run. And look at the time it took. So if I time this, I say time or I take to run this program, you're gonna see, you know, in terms of user time, it took like uh, one, one second, just about one second, okay? Uh, which which seems to be like, when I run it there, I wait like one second on this ECP, and it's finished. So one second to create and run a 100,000 go routine. So we know that these things are really, really lightweight. And this goes back to what I told you before, that your program could have thousands of goal routines. Here you see me do 100,000. All right, and of course you can try, see how fast you far you can push your processor by making this, you know, 200,000 or a million and see when your computer decides to complain. All right, uh, 200,000, yep. And still didn't take that much longer, right? Um, almost double, but not quite double, um, right? Um, so you can see pretty go routines are pretty performant. All right. So I said, oh, I'm going to do this a second way. So the way I like to think of this is if I call a go a worker, the worker, I should say, Hey worker, here's your input channel. And I want you, and this is a channel on which you can receive values only. And I want you to give me back a channel, which I can only receive value on. Okay. And I'm going to have the worker be the one who makes the output channel and then of course returns it to me uh, return out but we know it so if we left it this way it would be blocked right because it make the output channel and be blocked with near input so this has to be a go routine we know to make this into a go routine wrap it into a function uh, wrap it into a function like this so it's a function call and put go f u n c in front 
to hit a particular browser, like that. And so that is a go routine. So when I call my worker, it makes a channel, launches a go routine that does the same thing, waits on the input, gets a value right on the, up to that output, but then it, my worker is able to return white array right with that <laughs> immediately. Um, almost immediately on the line, it takes to just do bam, bam, these three individual statements. But I have a goal routine here that I've launched waiting to do that work. So the, the, the results is still sort of the same. Now, I don't actually have to sit here and do the launching of the goal routine. Here, I just simply have to do out is equals to, you know, whatever my worker returns. And then I can assign in equals out and, you know, sit in a loop and, and, and keep doing that, right? And so the results should still be the same because I'm um, creating a channel, I'm gonna use that force as input, then I call my worker, which is a force go routine, which is going to take that as input, launch a go routine, return another channel for me as the output for that go routine. I assign that to in and I go do the whole thing over again. And those still 100,000, or in this case 200,000 go routine are still gonna be block waiting until I send that first value of zero, they're all gonna run, and then from the very last one, I'm gonna get to read the output. And so, let's see if that works. Um, so here, ah, what can I use? Worker in type channel, da da da. Um, as channel type thing. Um, oh, so it's complaining about my types of variables here. So I don't wanna spend time sort of sorting out what type of variables I have and so on. So I'm just gonna make these all channels, but uh, know very well that we can spend time figuring out that. Oh, the only reason is because I have a channel that I send in or can only receive on here, um, will get return. And then when I try to assign it to in, which is a different, which is a channel of just a basic channel with bi-directional, of course it complains. So that's why. So I'm just gonna change that and just make it just channel for now. But if I had to write the code and focus on it, I'll, I'll do it. So you can see it works just the same, okay? And um, it's no slower or anything than what we had before. As a matter of fact, it looked like a little bit faster, but that could be just that time it ran it, right? Because you can see as the more I run it, it's, you know, so you can run one time and things. So I don't really think it's actually faster or slow. I think it's the same thing. I just think this way of doing it is a little bit clearer than the other way. But again, same result you decide the core part was whether or not in the loop I created the channels and paths both in, or I sort of go with what we sort of th think about generators and stuff where we launch them and they kind of take care of, they create a channel and just return that back. Up to you, depending on what you're comfortable with. I'm gonna stop this here. Um, don't wanna make it too long, I think it's already long, but hopefully you get the gist. Um, definitely post questions or comment or whatever look at that video. Um, thanks for your time again. Always appreciate that and see you in the next video.